Why by Denise Levitov, um, I think is perhaps one of the most powerful poems in, in the actual collection. Um, I think in, in terms of the message, it's really interesting how she is giving the reader a warning of what could happen if people don't intervene to stop the atrocities that are happening yeah. in, in Vietnam. Yeah, definitely. I was thinking it's really interesting what strikes me is that she's trying the message that I get from the poem is she's trying to sort of remind people um, to remember a culture because of how it was, not because mm. of how it's been devastated. Mm. So try and remember sort of the gentility, of the, the, mm. the, the innocence of a culture. Mm. Don't just remember it because of the bombs, mm. and because of the bloodshed. Mm. Um, and that's something, and again, it's something that always reminds me at the moment of growing up sort of with the, the Iraq invasion. Mm. I will always associate Iraq and Afghanistan um, unfortunately with a war-torn country mm. because of the media mm. and the way that we've always sort of been given these images of devastation mm. and I won't unfortunately I don't know as much about the people mm. and the way that they lived before this mm. war happened and I think that's something that maybe Levitop is trying to show that countries like Vietnam and Southeast Asia and sort of other ones on parts of World Africa mm. that try and look beyond the war mm. and the devastation yeah. and look at the people and the yeah. innocence. I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think she's trying to, she per tries to personalise a war, doesn't she? Yeah. And give it a human face. And I think that's why she's writing this poem to really remind people that although it's millions of miles away and it's not connected with your life, yeah. This is, this is what's happening, it's very real, yeah. you know, you've got people dying, you've got... Those of, when looking at analysing language in this poem, uh, what strikes me immediately is, in the first stanza, the first part of the poem, um, are the specific references to the culture that place this in a very different culture. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got the use of the bone and ivory, jade and silver, all natural resources and really simple resources. Mm. I think it's interesting, they're not bright, garish colours, they're mm. really sort of bland colours mm. that maybe reflect the innocence, the naivety, and the simplicity of this culture mm. and the way it was. That none of it, it wasn't an offensive culture, mm. so it certainly didn't deserve to be mm. invaded in such a devastating, shocking way. Then, because then again, I look at sort of the words that are used further on, and you've got this direct con uh, this contrast. Um, so you've got scream, um, bombs, so you've got the culture that was so gentle before mm. and then how it's been affected by the by war the um, oh. yeah, and the violence as mm. the poem goes on. Um, and again you've got the reference um, to rice and bamboo, so the idea again that this was in a really specific mm. culture, mm. part of Southeast Asia, mm. uh, where they did live simply. Mm. And I, I think that there is a really interesting use of contrast and picking up on that delicacy of the culture um, and there's a contrast between the peacefulness and then the very vivid use of the, those words like you've said um, about the bombs. Yeah. Um, yeah and I think there's interesting really sort of powerful use of metaphor in this mm. poem as well so I mean the first stanza um, did they hold ceremonies to reference the opening of buds? Mm. Literally, this again, it appears that they took absolute delight in the most mm. simple things in life, yeah. and that they absolutely admired nature mm. and how it blooms mm. sort of during spring. But then I also think of buds uh, metaphorically as children and the innocence of yeah. children. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They absolutely revere mm. childhood, mm. and children were a real sort of central point of this community yeah. and this yeah. society. Yeah. And a bud is also something that's not been, not been harmed yet, it's not grown, it's still very. Um, natural and neutral and yeah. you know something that's been kind of protected from the world at the moment it's yeah. only when it blooms out that you'll get the outside um, input and being affected by your know, nature yeah yeah definitely mm. and then if you look at sort of the answer that's given um, the next stanza um, it says that after the children were killed there were no more buds mm. and this again this sort of finality mm. um, and this abrupt answer really mm. that um, something has been lost, the yes. innocence has mm. been lost, mm. um, and perhaps childhood, mm. as it was known, mm. has been lost because of what the children are witnessing. Yeah. Um, as the war. So we know this poem was written before mm. the war had finished, mm. so this is maybe a, a prophecy or mm. a, you know, a, a prediction of what could happen yeah. um, by the end of this war. So Lavatoff is absolutely imagining that childhood is going to lose something. Mm. something well, it always, it always is the, the children, that are the, the innocent party of war, that people, yeah. it's the message that people do get, isn't it? Yeah. When you do focus on the innocence, yeah. you focus on the children, that can 
hopefully prompt people to react and yeah. respond and, and do something. And I think the poem, you know, it is about trying to make people stand up and listen and do something yeah. about it yeah. by focusing on the children. Yeah, and you always think of the famous image that was sort of shown yeah. in the media at the mm-hmm. time of the, the naked child absolutely distraught running through yeah. uh, the streets of uh, Vietnam. That always sort of comes to mind as well yeah. when I, I read that part of the poem. Um, I also think the word echo is really interesting. Um, because I just imagine when you think of an echo again, you think of something that as time is going on, mm. something's being lost. And I do mm. think maybe Levitoff feels that as time is moving on, parts of this culture mm. are going to be lost mm. or something is going to be lost. Mm. And again, an echo is really faint. Mm. Um, <coughs> it's not loud or offensive, and it reminds me again of. Mm. The gentility mm. of the culture. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting word to pick up on because you could think of it in terms of um, an echo, as in an echo and a repetition. And I think that can make it into a universal message that it's not actually just about Vietnam and what's going on there. These atrocities are happening all over the world, mm. they have happened in the past, and they're going to continue to happen yeah. unless we do something about it. So I think echo is, is an interesting thing to pick up on there. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, uh, moths as well, sort of, it's mm. sort of part of the same uh, stanza. Um, so it says it was reported that their singing resembled the flights of moths in moonlight. Mm. So again, this idea that really sort of inoffensive, mm. uh, gentle, sort of this sort, Yeah, it's very delicate, 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 but also yeah. quite pretty about it. Yeah. Um, and almost magical, you know, the idea of moonlight. Um, it's, it's a very magical, enchanting time. Yeah. So I think, as, as, as well, she's kind of highlighting there that... Um, that there was something enchanting about their culture. Yeah. And I think reminding us in the opening of what their culture was, yeah. but with very definite references. Um, I think that's a nice image to, to kind of focus on towards the end, because it, it does remind us of the romantic yeah. kind of culture that yeah. is there, the simplicity of it. Yeah. The most interesting structural point has got to be the way in which the first stanza is a series of questions yeah. and the second stanza is a series of answers. And one of the questions is always, well, who is abs- a- actually asking these questions, isn't yeah. it? Who, who is this person? Why do they want to know? Yeah. Um, and, and I know that there are, there are various kind of suggestions about it. Um, it certainly seems to be somebody who is quite naive for me. Yeah. Um, somebody who is very detached yes. from the situation. Because um, I think you see in the responses, um, there is an increasing kind of anger, but not an anger that's powerful, like in nothing's changed. It's an anger that still has a dignity, yes. which reflects the culture that, that she's actually writing about. Yeah, yeah. I imagine it's sort of to be a soldier, mm. perhaps. One of the it could be a soldier that's reporting yeah, yeah. back or something, yeah, the yeah. higher ranking officer. Mm. Um, sort of, you no, know, oh, the soldier's giving the answers, a soldier that has witnessed firsthand mm. what's, go- what's happened to these people and to mm. the parts of Vietnam. Mm. And then it's this officer that is maybe asking the questions who is detached and he doesn't know enough mm. yet about, about it. Mm. But I think. I mean, you said it shows maybe the you know, naivety or the innocence mm. of the questioner. Mm. I, was, I think all the most of the ignorance in mm. I feel a bit yeah. more angry yeah. about it. Naive and ignorant. Yeah, I think Absolutely. it's ignorance. Yeah. And if it is sort of, so, sort of the idea of a soldier mm. being involved, I think it's really ignorant that mm. they're living in a, a country which is they're partly responsible for devastating mm. and they still don't really know enough mm. about it. I think, I think what is interesting there as well, picking up on that, is in that second stand and how response, the response is given. Um, in two, two of the responses start off with sir. Yeah. So, but when I kind of considered that, um, the sir is almost, again, that kind of naive, I can't believe you're asking me these questions, kind yeah. of. It's, it's not in a respectful sir. No. It's, it's a distancing impact, I yeah. think that. Yeah. I also think in terms of structure, it's really interesting that it's it's all in past tense. So from the title of the poem, what were they like? The sense mm-hmm. that something has been lost, mm-hmm. that it's forgotten, mm-hmm. and that you're having to interrogate mm-hmm. and try and look back all mm-hmm. of the time. And, and also the sense that it's gone. Yeah. If something, you're talking about something historically, mm-hmm. it's as if it's 
finished, mm. it's part of some history mm. and it's no longer alive yet, which could mm. be a reflection in the word echo. Mm. The idea that this echo is becoming fainter and fainter yeah, as time yeah. goes on. And I, and I think that's something that a lot of the other poets pick up on when we have references to historical um, events, you know, that if we don't keep talking about them, yeah. Uh, bring danger, number one of the events being forgotten, but number two of them being repeated because we're not learning any lessons. Yeah. And I think we pick that up, you know, in vultures equally as, as we do in what would they like. Yeah. Um, yeah, I also think another sort of structural feature which we mentioned earlier is the contrast as well. Mm. This poem is a real poem of contrast. Mm. So sort of, between, in terms of physical look at the poem, the short first stanza mm. that could show it's like ignorance or naivety, mm. which you want to look at it, mm. of the questioner, but then the growing anger and bitterness, mm. maybe frustration mm. of the answers that are given. Mm. Uh, I tend to think more frustration, as if why does this person not know more, mm. uh, which you can see particularly. Mm. Uh, in five, they're mm. actually saying it is not remember. Remember, yeah. most peasants, there's a the, frustration, the, you know, really sort of building yeah. up frustration about yeah. this. And you must remember, yeah. most for peasants, their land was in rice and bamboo. And they sort of play on the words that they're given. So when peaceful clouds were reflected in the paddies, mm. and the water buffalo stepped surely along the terraces, there's sort of this idea that the peace isn't there any longer. Mm. And then he sort of reflects in the line when bombs smashed those mirrors. Mm. Really sort of powerful imagery yeah. um, that shows something of absolutely being shattered. Mm. In terms of, of my personal response to the poem, I find it really thought provoking and really emotive um, because it, it does, it, it challenges you to consider not just the situation in Vietnam but these co conflicts throughout the world and that are occurring now and to me I think you can, this has a real immediacy for us now yeah. because when you think of what is happening in Afghanistan, yeah. um, you know, what lessons have we learned from, from what has happened in the past, you know, we talk about, you know, the World War II in vultures and we talk about Vietnam here and I'm sure that in the future there will be an echo still of the same sort of sen senses and, and yeah. sentiment. Yeah. So for me, it's very powerful in making me reflect on, you know, who is getting involved, yeah. who is trying to make a change, and and who isn't. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. My sort of initial reaction again is to place it in sort of contemporary society mm -hmm. uh, and our world today. And what strikes me is, as I've already said, the ignorance of the questioner, but also. Mm -hmm. The fact that they're just willing to sort of categorise, mm. um, stereotype the whole race of people mm. um, and label them really in quite a patronising way, and something that I think we're guilty of doing a lot mm. in the Western world. Mm. When we look at cultures that are so different, so for example, um, we've got, as I said earlier, the cultural references of bone and ivory, mm. had they an epic poem, mm. romanticising the culture. Um, and showing sort of the innocence of the culture, but also they're all sort of cliche things mm. that you think of, maybe you think of Vietnam. Mm. Um, and I think maybe um, it's something that I think is maybe we need to sort of challenge mm. some of the stereotypes mm. maybe we do have mm. um, of a culture. Mm. Um, and that's just something I've thought of now, really. And that maybe when we do look at countries that are in the media a lot and connected to war, what on one hand, look beyond the war mm. of course and try and find out more about the culture mm. but also don't stereotype that maybe yeah. as the victim yeah. as always the innocent mm. uh, I think I think it's interesting what you say there I think you can pick that up in, in some of the other poems as well can't you about um, how we label a culture yeah um, like it, it, nothing's changed again we've got mm. this you know when you're the stands that's dedicated um, to the working man's in while mm. here on your jeans sits on the floor again mm. it's another kind mm. of something that shouldn't be done, it's another generalisation. So we're thinking really along the lines of how the poets are exploring this idea of prejudice. Yeah. And, and I think that comes across in unrelated instance and hard cast too, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Mm. Um, and again, with two scavengers, I suppose yeah. that's explored. Although we, I do feel that Ferling Getty absolutely sympathises and admires the scavengers above the elegant, mm. uh, cool couple. Um, there is again this idea that we are judging people because mm. maybe sort of the way that they look and just stare at a garbage man with a plastic blazer mm. um, and driving a, a garage truck mm. um, around. Mm. Um, so yeah, just the idea that sort of bringing back to what were they like, mm. um, sort of challenging some of the, the patronising stereotypes yeah. that we probably do have mm. of other cultures.